Hi everyone, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Use the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. If you've attended these before, you know the drill. I'm in Seattle. Hetty is in New York. Emma's in New Jersey. Halifax, Nova Scotia. Oh, coming on hot. I love it. Top that, folks. New York City, hello. Welcome. New Jersey. Welcome, welcome. We'll let a few more people get tuned in and then we will get started. I'm sorry, my camera is doing a funny zoomy thing tonight. I'm really sorry, folks. I'll try to hold still so it stops doing that. All right. That looks like it's leveled off. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Lara Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop here in Seattle called Book Larder. We have just started to do some in person author talks and cooking classes in the shop. But for the time being, we are continuing to do these virtual author talks on Zoom. And the great part about it is that it allows um, people from all over the, the country and sometimes all over the world to join us. And it allows us to have conversations like the one tonight where uh, both of our interviewer and our author are on the East Coast and I'm here. And you know, it's a conversation that we might not have otherwise been able to do in person, at least not in Seattle, unless I managed to convince them both to be here at the same time. We are of course here tonight to celebrate Emma LaPeruque's first book, Food 52, Big Little Recipes. It is a really wonderful collection of, just as it says, um, recipes that give you a lot of flavor with just a few ingredients um, after the column that Emma does for Food 52. She is going to be in conversation with longtime friend of book larder, Hetty McKinnon, herself an author and regular contributor to Food 52. And, um, just all around lovely person and interviewer. They are going to talk about Emma's wonderful new book. They will of course leave time for questions. So if you could, please just use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you have a question. Use the chat to talk to each other and use that Q&A button please for questions for Emma. The book is of course available at booklarder.com and you can support the talk by purchasing it from us and thank you to all of you that have done that so far. Um, Emma was good enough to send us book plates and so our copies are signed by her and um, like I said I will drop a link to that in the chat to make it easier for you to order a copy if you would like. Finally, we are also recording the talk tonight, so if you have to pop off early or if you uh, just uh, want to share it or watch it again, it will be on our YouTube channel, the Book Larder YouTube channel, in the next 48 hours, so you can check it out there. All right, that's all from me. Please join me in welcoming Hetty McKinnon and Emma LaPeruque. Hi. Hi. How are you? Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Emma. <laughs> Sorry, I was just sorting out my screen. I had too many things open. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And congratulations, Emma, on your beautiful book, which I have here, Big Little Thank Recipes. You. <laughs> How does it feel to have your first book out? I hope so, you've been celebrating. Surreal. It feels very surreal. Um, you know, I mean, I think like so much of what I do is online. Mm. So that process I think is even longer than people think by the time like you have an idea to when it publishes it's like months yeah. yes. but a book is years so it's been yes. like uh it, I it feels so long ago that we started working on it and now to like have it in people's homes is so uh crazy yeah yeah I mean because some of the recipes are from your your, your the column of the same mm -hmm. name big little yeah. recipes yeah. on food 52 which I've worked with you on before and it's yes. Super fun. And it's just, um, it's such an incredible and modern concept, you know, like I'm so um, surprised by the, the, the recipes that you've come up with, with so few ingredients. And I really am looking forward to talking to you about that. But I did want to start by, um, the, in, in the introduction, which is written by Amanda Hesser and Mel Stubbs, mm -hmm. who started 552 or those years ago, they say something like this. They say about you, um, she's our favorite kind of cook, 
imaginative, resourceful, intolerant of boring food. That's such a great term, intolerant of boring food. <laughs> so where did this approach to cooking and this interest, this particular interest in food start for you? Like how did you develop this approach to food? Well, I think my excitement about food just came from the same place it does for everyone. I really liked eating when I was little um, and I really liked writing too. And eventually that those two loves, I figured out that I could do them at the same time. Um, with the few ingredient concept, I think, you know, it was really something that we saw as a gap on Food 52 specifically. Mm -hmm. It wasn't um, a specialty of mine before I dug into it. It was something that we thought would make a great column that had a lot of service to it. You know, yeah. a lot of people I think have talked about time um, and, you know, this can be made in 20 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, the ingredient out thing, uh, that's also been explored too. But I think in our site, there was um, where we could kind of focus on it more. Like we could do it in the weekly way, really dig into that concept. You know, I joined yeah. Food 52, like just coming up on four years ago. Um, yes. And I started the calling within, I think, a few months of when I joined yes. the team. Yes, because this um, started in 2018. Yeah. So, you know, it was very, uh, it was kind of like one of my big first recipe development yeah. ventures in the role that I took. Um, and it was one of those things that I was excited about to begin with. And then the more I dug into it, the more excited I got, the more I believed in it. You know, it felt like a challenge yeah. at first more than anything. Um, and then it became something that I was like, okay, like you, uh, you have one possibility, but then you start seeing all these possibilities, the more you spend time with it. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. assuming that it's something you can become completely obsessed with. You know, yeah. like this this way of um, taking out ingredients, and like certainly when I was reading the book, I was like thinking about the way I cook and the mm. things that I do, which are, you know, we all cook out of habits. I have the same rituals. I almost start every single recipe with garlic and onions and olive oil, like yes. without fail, no matter what it is. Yeah. Um, but you you kind of skip that step in a lot of these recipes, which I found. Um, really interesting, but I, I'm, mm -hmm. I haven't had a chance to cook anything yet, but I'm assuming that there are, well, we'll, we'll get to the tips later on because you, Emma has a lot of um, tips about how to get flavor out of mm -hmm. things that you wouldn't quite expect. But anyway, we'll touch on a little bit of that um, later on. But I, I, what I wanted to ask is as a person that like I, I mean, I think a lot of us in food have really huge pantries. Like we have, you know, and hundreds of spices and just you know condiments galore in our fridge and and you know like you in this book you say you never ask the home cook to buy more than three ingredients for a dish which is mind-blowing to me um but I think it's like a mindset right the big little recipes mm. is a mindset it's like really recalibrating the way you think about food and cooking um for people that maybe have never cooked big little recipes before how do you are there any suggestions on how we kind of recalibrate and rethink the way we cook yeah I mean I think you know I I felt this myself when I started the column and you know like you're saying it is a mindset you kind of have to commit to the temptation to add things is um high and, yes. you know, I see that in comments all the time. Yes. The cool thing about a website is, you know, we can constantly be engaging with our community and troubleshooting with them. And, you know, one of the most common comments we get with the column is, well, what if, like you're saying, what if I added garlic or what if I added yes. Parmesan or what if I added this or what if I added that? And my first answer is always like, but what if you didn't, you know, like mm -hmm. what if, what if you taste it and like sit with it for a second and kind of let it be what it is. Um, and, you know, the thing with the recipes is like, they're, for me, they're flavor first. Mm -hmm. The lack of ingredients is never meant to be a, like a blandness or a lack of spice or acidity or saltiness or whatever it is that dish is trying to accomplish. Um, so I think it's being really mindful about if I'm adding something, why, and can yeah. I get it from something that is already in the recipe? Um, you know, like, not having ingredients that are doing the same job at the same mm -hmm. time 
Okay. And if you have something that is, you know, really savory, like, can you bump up the quantity? Is there mm-hmm. something that can be drawn from the ingredient that is already there? You know, can you use it raw one way and cooked another way? Yeah. Trying to think like outside the box of, okay, well, we have this ingredient. How can we get even more out of it than we already yeah. are? So for a home cook, if you, so for example, you know, like the garlic, the onion thing or the spices, if yes. you're tempted to add these things, would you say to the home cook, actually just don't when you're like, as an experiment, cooking from big little recipes, no. cook it the way it's written? Is, is that well, what you're saying? I, I mean, I think I'm a, I don't know if you feel the same way as someone who develops recipes, but when I, I mean, I have I, 50, 100 cookbooks at this point mm. and I love cooking from them. I find it very relaxing for someone else to lead the way. Um, yes. But I very, very rarely measure and I very rarely follow recipes to a T. I'll have it out and it will be guiding me, but it's truly mm-hmm. guiding. And I'm, unless it's like a baking recipe where I have my scale and I know if I add too much baking powder, we're going to have a real problem. Yeah. I, I just, I, I find that to be the most relaxing way to spend, you know, a Friday or Saturday night. And I feel like if people feel most relaxed by not following the recipes to a T and if they really want to add the chili flakes or uh, hot sauce or whatever it is they think is going to give the recipe that boost that they want like perfect I think the good thing about starting with so few ingredients is even if you add one or two things on top of the recipe it's not going to be a big deal yeah and if, and I mean, if you're enjoying it what's I mean it's all good right yeah I mean yeah. honestly guys I mean this is like some of these some of these recipes I only have like five ingredients four ingredients and some of those ingredients are salt and oil so um this one anyway uh, before I go into the recipes I mean I guess um (laughs) some of the recipes in this book are from your beloved column um but most of them are new so can you tell me like you're working on the column and then you're working on the book like how did you go about kind of you know differentiating and like kind of keeping the two projects very separate yeah, it was hard. I mean, a lot of times uh, we were, it's so much of the time that the book was happening. I mean, all of it, we were doing both at the same time. Um, my, when we set out to do the table of contents, you know, the the way that we were looking at the book was that we could do 50% pulled from the column. Mm-hmm. Um, that was kind of, you know, like the project template. And um I love making things harder for myself than they have to be. So I thought like, no way are we doing 50%. Like, I like, instead of doing 30 recipes, like let's do like 20 or whatever, you know, number I was thinking, I just wanted to pull as little from the column as I possibly could. Cause I wanted the book to feel really new for people. And, you know, the recipes that we pulled from the column, I also retested all of those. Mm-hmm. So I didn't want anything to be untouched, even though, you know, for the revs, I, they have been tested and they, they were finished products in themselves, but I just, I couldn't stop messing with everything, you know, oh, cool. like we had a, a pot roast on the site that was a pot roast with uh, 40 cloves of garlic. Oh and, yes, I saw that. Um, for the book, we changed the cut of beef, we changed to a brisket, but also in the retesting of it, um, the one on the site, it had vegetable stock as like the bracing liquid. And when I was retesting it, I thought, do we need the vegetable stock? Like, what is the vegetable stock doing if we have all these vegetables here anyway? And we have this giant piece of beef and it's all simmering together for hours. Like, what what is the vegetable stock accomplishing? And when I was working with it in the retest, it was like, oh, we can just get away with water. Like, we don't actually need the vegetable stock. And that was sort of the process with the the column uh, picks, like very few of them. That's, yeah. your, 40, that's your 40 cloves of garlic. <laughs> no, and that's the brisket on a sandwich, is it? On, that on is toast. pulled pork. Oh, yeah. that's pulled pork. Oh, that's yeah. this recipe. Yeah. That was another one from the column too. Yeah. But very yeah. few of them, I mean, some of them are very similar, um, but all of them were taken through the kitchen again and kind of asked all those questions that I'm always trying to ask myself of, like, do we need this? Do we need this? Do we need this? Yeah. yeah. Um, did you choose just automatically your most popular recipes or were there, did you choose them because you thought they were ones that you could make better? Um, how did a you go lot, about choosing those? A lot of them were 
like fan favorites. Um, yeah. Like the meatloaf in one is, is one that it ended up very different in the book, but we have this easy beef meatloaf on the site. It's like a five ingredient, really basic classic American recipe. And like, I'm, I'm not a meatloaf person. I didn't grow up on meatloaf. I like don't even <laughs> really eat meat on my own anymore. Um, and I just didn't want it in the book, but we just kept talking about the meatloaf. It was so popular and we thought, okay, we need the meatloaf in the book. Um, then that one got changed a lot too. But so there were ones that, you know, we felt like uh, they were picks for me and then they were picks for yeah. our community. And often those were the same picks. And sometimes, you know, everyone has their own thing that they want for dinner. Yeah, I can't even find the meat. What, the, what did the meatloaf turn into in the book? It's a pork meatloaf now. And oh, okay. it changed from beef to pork and the cab- onions changed to cabbage. Okay. Ketchup changed to mustard. It was a lot of flips but the from a recipe development perspective it was very very similar but kind of making yeah. these swaps that it ended up being this totally different dish but in our heads it was originally a pull from the column yeah but then I you know kept changing this and that and it turned into something else kind of fun isn't it what a great opportunity to make something better <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was fun yeah so what about like I, I always wonder you know like um comfort food now you, you I think you, you say in the introduction of the book um that the the recipes in this book are the meals you crave the most mm-hmm. but how do you go you know like you know there are all these comfort foods like lasagna for example mm-hmm. or like uh I don't know like a, a palm the parmesan or, like these things traditionally have so many recipes like how do you go about transforming like a recipe like that into a big little recipe Yeah. I mean, I think the ones that have so many ingredients to begin with, those feel really satisfying and fun. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like we have that open faced eggplant parm in the book and uh, you know, it has a tomato saw like the, you know, part of the hook is this is just easier. There's not the slicing and frying and the layering and the baking dish. Um, Yeah it feels very, you know, it's like a vegetarian entree. I think it feels really meaty because, you know, you have a fork and knife, you have this giant steak, like eggplant half. Um, but like, you know, the tomato sauce is a place where like a lot of simplification can happen. Like I, mm-hmm. I love a really complicated tomato sauce, like a puttanesca that has like all these different ingredients going on. But this one, it's sort of like the um, Marcella has on, you know, tomato oh, and butter yeah. and onion. Like it's, if you add tomatoes, and enough fat and enough salt, even without the onion, it tastes really, really, really good. And that's sort of what that tomato sauce is going on. It's just canned tomatoes, more olive oil than you would think, and a really confident amount of salt. And that ends up being this tomato sauce that I would just like happily eat like a soup. Mm. And then it, you know, really carries the dish. It really pulls everything together, even though there's not uh, garlic or onion or, you know, chili flakes, mm. maybe things that a lot of people see as defaults and tomato sauce. Oh, it looks super delicious. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's like right up my alley. That, that is that again. Um, do you, I mean, what are your top three? I mean, you talk a lot about ingredients. Obviously ingredients mm. are really important in cooking in the big, big little recipe way. Um, what are your top three or four ingredients that you think are very powerful in the pantry if, if you want to cook like this? Mm. Well, I think definitely something like pickled or fermented is mm. such a huge boost because you get the, the product itself and then you also get the brine. That's yeah. a trick that comes up a lot in the book is things that have a like um, a byproduct that maybe you think is just there as a supporting player, but it actually can be just as, if not more important. Um, And the flavor there is so huge. You know, things that come with this huge punch and personality, that's huge. Um, Vegetables that have two different vegetables within them. Similarly, I find those really um, helpful, like a beet. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, it comes with a green that um, like a lot of people chop off. I was at the farmer's market last weekend and I think it was beets someone was buying, but 
the, maybe it was carrots or, you know, the farmer was saying, well, do you want us to chop these greens off to the person who's in front of me? They said, no, I'll take them. And the farmer said, like, a lot of people are asking me to, you know, just throw them and compost them because they didn't want to take them home. And the farmer was saying that they found that really like a depressing trend. Oh, yeah. Because the greens are, they're greens. You know, you go and maybe you're going to then go to go to another stand and buy kale. Maybe it's a green that you're more comfortable working with or spinach, but, you know, things that come with those extras, I think are so um, powerful to have around because you feel like you have two different things in the same dish, even though you don't actually. You call them two for one ingredients, right? In the book. Yeah. Which is a great way of looking at it. Yeah, it's helpful. I mean, it it makes a dish feel so full. Like we have a, um, a chicken thigh recipe with radishes and radish greens, which are really um, spicy and fun, almost like a mustard green kind of vibe. Yeah. Um, yeah. And when you put it next to the radish itself, like if you had never seen a radish in its full state, you would never guess that they had come from the same thing because they just, I mean, they have different textures, they have different flavors, they're different colors. Um, but yeah, it's just I, I, think, one um, thing. I think the radish greens are some of the yummiest of, of all the tops because yeah. they, depending on what you do with them, it, they take on a very different profile. I mean, as you were saying, you can pan fry them and they yeah. kind of really mellow out. But if you use it in a pesto or something, it's still quite spicy because it's raw. And yeah. I definitely think I've done that before where I've made an, an entire meal from one bunch of, from um, one bunch of radish and it's Mm-hmm. so satisfying to do that so satisfying yeah I love cooked radishes they're so I, yes. ate, I ate them raw a lot growing up but cooked ones they're um they feel very like wintry and cozy like yes. uh, like a turnip kind of vibe yeah and you talked about brining and this is just something um the brine from fermented products mm-hmm. um I was going I've just had this interest in it lately every time I open a packet of feta cheese yeah I think that brine why am I pouring it out? Like, have you used it before? And how, how do you use it if you, if you have used it? This is just yeah. for me personally, because I'm interested. <laughs> oh my God, I love feta brine. We, there's a recipe in the book. It's one, of my, it's one of my favorites in the salad chapter, which I think is my favorite chapter in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure you, it's mine too. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you brine radicchio in the feta brine so I think maybe you've seen this with some bitter greens like chicories if you soak something that's pretty bitter to begin with in ice water it kind of draws out that bitterness so in this case you soak it in iced feta brine and it draws out the bitterness but it also imparts a like a salty cheesiness to the radicchio it's really uh like it's kind of trippy when you taste the radicchio after it's even been sitting in there for a few minutes because uh, something that started out kind of, I think one note in an off-putting way for a lot of people um, develops this real umami and complexity. Um, And then this this wasn't in the book, but this is one of my favorite recipes from the column very recently. We did a feta brine martini. So instead of olive brine, you do feta brine. And it's weird, but it's weird in a really fun way. I think it was like a late night thought I had because martinis are like my go-to drink at home and we had feta around and I thought like, why not? Like, why not drink your cheese with your potato chips after work? And it's this kind of cloudy uh, drink that feels like a snack at the same time. And it's, oh. it's really nice. Uh, martinis are my go-to drink too. Not at home, but when I go out. Um, and I, I specifically love it because I feel like I'm getting a meal with my yes, drink. With your olives. I with love my it. olives. <laughs> and I'm, I'm naturally a very savory person anyway. So I'm like, yes. yeah, I get to eat a meal with my drink. So two for one. Yeah. It's like a big little it. drink. It's another um, two for one. <laughs> the other two for one, which I absolutely love. Um, I've seen this done probably on Food 52 is this soup that you've got. It's a spicy corn soup. Yes. With um, shiitakes and green onions. Mm. And you talk about using the, um, the corn husk. Is that what you call it? The corn husk to, to make the stock, yeah. which is so clever because it has so much flavor. Yeah, it does. It really does. I, I remember making corn broth for the first time several years ago. And 
it was like that moment of, you know, thinking about all the corn cobs who I had thrown out over mm-hmm. my life. How many dozens of cobs that I just tossed in the trash when if you just put them with water and you season it with salt and it's, it's just like chicken bones or whatever you would make, for, you know, people might associate with broth a little bit yes. more readily, but like the cobs still have a ton of flavor. It's, it doesn't come off with the kernels. Like it comes off when you soak it in water, just like tea or anything like that. It just keeps drawing out all that awesome flavor. And then you have a stock that you can make a corn soup with, or you can just stick in the freezer. I'm a big freezer person. Yes. So am I. There's no room ever in my freezer. (laughs) I think that's such a great thing to remember. I mean, um, you know, it's just, it is such a waste to throw out all that flavor. So um, the, the other thing you talk about is the value of water in cooking, water. Um, which I thought was um, such a you know when I read it I was like oh of course like absolutely we don't even think about how valuable water is I mean when I'm making yeah. lately something I've been doing is when I'm making dressing I'll add a little bit of water yeah. and it just adds this kind of nice smoothness it's not something I used to do um, earlier on in my salad making career but I have recently discovered the power of water also yeah. but can can you tell us a little bit more about um what you talk about in the book, like how water is a weapon in minimalist cooking? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think, you know, I, I was the same way for most of the time that I've been cooking. I think honestly, there's often training you're taught the opposite, like why use water when you could use stock or something that has flavor in it. Um, But I think it does a disservice to the simplicity of water because it can do so many different things. Like you're saying with dressings, like if you have something that's um, really fatty, like an oil or a nut butter tahini, if you add water, it creates this um, emulsification and it actually makes this incredible texture that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. Um, You know, if you're adding it to something like the meatloaf, there's a ton of water in that meatloaf. A lot of people add milk to meatloaves Mm -hmm. but in the case of the water it's used as a way to deglaze the pan that picks up all the flavor from the sauteed cabbage in this case or the sauteed onions like on the website and then it kind of becomes this instant broth and adds moisture it prevents it from getting overcooked um you know so i think and especially with stocks like we were saying there's corn stock uh there's parmesan stock if you're cooking beans that stock you know a lot of people just throw out the bean cooking liquid but if you taste it it's it's incredible I love bean cooking liquid so good I mean it's and it's like if you add just a little nutritional yeast to that all of a sudden you have this amazing like vegan chicken broth Um, even even, from the can the canned stuff is right I mean sometimes you know if you've got sodium problems you should be careful but yeah um in soups it's a thickener it's a natural thickener totally yeah 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 so So, I was looking yeah I was just looking for the cool um you have a whole page about stocks yes um which is here and you talk about how you can basically use one ingredient to make a stock Mm -hmm. because I feel like stocks are one of those I mean just continuing on from our corn cob discussion (laughs) I feel like you know a lot of home cooks feel like stocks so intimidating to make Mm -hmm. at home or you know they're like what can I put in what can't I put in and you've just kind of broken it down to these really simple categories you know like stop taking stock so seriously which is completely correct um but you know you've you've got things like mushrooms you could make a stock from just mushrooms which Mm -hmm. I do often kombu Mm -hmm. um garlic bit of greens I mean and so this is these are like one ingredient stocks yeah, I mean, I think stocks, they are very complicated. Like when I, I worked in restaurants, you know, there were sort of things that like a million ingredients would go in. It would be simmering for, you know, a dozen hours. Um, yeah. And those are really deeply flavorful stocks, you know, and for certain cases, those are wonderful. Um, but I think where it becomes a problem is if that becomes like the only box for stock yeah. and then you feel like, okay, well, it's either that or nothing so I might as well get the bouillon or box stock and I always have those around too yeah. but there's so much opportunity to play around with ingredients they already have you know like like the garlic stock um you're truly yeah, just chopping up a bunch of garlic and simmering it and then you uh when you strain it the garlic is so soft that you mash it through a fine mesh sieve 
and it kind of um it like enriches the broth um just wow. like you know a roasted garlic would like on bread or something and with the salt it's like I was I just drink it out of a mug which I know <laughs> everyone has jokes about garlic but I love garlic so much I just I couldn't get enough of it and it's it's so savory it's so intense and it's just because you kind of go all in on that one ingredient and you know that only simmers for like an hour but there's hour. also like a a bitter green stock like if you're blanching broccoli rob which mm -hmm. is so bitter it's only in the water for like a few minutes and then you taste that liquid if you add a little salt to it it's intense like it's a really intense um highly vegetal stock which i think is nice mm -hmm. you can't really buy those very easily like it just tastes like like green you know if green yeah. was a taste it just is so um bright and really nice yeah I've never tried bitter greens before but I, I I feel like when I'm blanching I don't do this very often I don't often blanch broccoli but when <laughs> I do mm -hmm. it the stock the water has this beautiful greenness totally. to it so totally next time I'll have to keep that and use it yeah for something. yeah we use there's a, a broccoli cheddar pasta in the book yeah um, it's like a two ingredient sauce and the it's mostly pureed broccoli with a tiny bit of cheese less than you would think you would need but it's thinned out from the broccoli blanching liquid but also yeah. it's the pasta cooking liquid so you get the broccoli flavor in the water but also the starchiness and then it creates the sauce but the water it, it was water to begin with, but along the way of the recipe, it became a lot more powerful, which I think is, you know, like we were saying with the water, um, it can be used in so many different ways than I think yeah. people give it credit for, just like yeah. with the things you already have around. Yeah, there's so many yeah. lovely kind of learning points from this book that just really makes you rethink the things that, you know, the everyday things. I mean, there's nothing yeah. like you have to go out of your way to, to source it's just things that we yeah. use and have in our kitchen anyway but it's just thinking about them a different way which is one of the things I really love about the things that you've written about in the book um the other thing I, I loved actually and it was just a small point but jam you talk about using jam beyond just toast mm -hmm. which is pretty cool T tell us about <laughs> that recipe that was really cool I love that yeah that's in the salad chapter too um it's for a vinaigrette so i think you can fact check me on this i think it's two parts jam two parts oil one part vinegar or maybe i'm messing yeah, up the is, ratio it is something like that hold on let me try and okay. find it um, um but it's just jam oil and vinegar and then you season it with salt and it's um I guess sweet, savory vinaigrette. I think you said that you're a very savory person. I'm a very savory person too. Yeah, but it's such an um, interesting way. I mean, I think there are definitely salads that benefit from that sweetness. Yes, yeah. Um, and I, I even find like things like um, sweet potatoes, but the, actually the sweet vegetables do benefit from sweetness um, yeah. to amplify you know the depth of their flavor but then you know I use a different ingredient to balance it out say like a sharp cheese or something like yeah. to, to create that balance but yeah. the uh, I just thought that was such an interesting concept because I've never thought about using jam in that way you know beyond yeah. just toast I'm just trying to find the recipe but um we always yeah. have it in my fridge my husband likes it on he likes it on toast I I almost never have a sweet breakfast um but I really like you're saying I like adding sweetness to savory recipes and I like adding savoriness to sweet recipes so yes. you know in the book the vinaigrette is on um it's like on shaved fennel that's you know oh yeah so thin that it becomes like ribbons almost um, yeah and like you're saying with the sharp cheese, there's like a, a blue cheese on it, but. Oh, perfect. The vinaigrette I think could be good on so many things. I think it would be really good on kale, be really good on arugula, which would be, you know, yes. it's kind of that pepperiness. Um, yes. And it would probably be really good on meat too. I haven't tried that, but it's just, I mean, it's, you just put it in a jar or whisk it up with a spoon and it, the jam kind of in the same way as mustard, it helps it get this creamy emulsified texture which is really nice um because it's like you only added that one ingredient to just oil and vinegar but it makes a really big difference 
Oh, yes. Oh, it's fig. Is, it, is this one? Shea fennel? I'm oh, sorry. I've yes. been looking yeah, for it yeah. the whole time. There you go. It looks so good. So it's a shea fennel with fig vinaigrette. Mm -hmm. and blue cheese so you've used fig jam in that fig in that jam but you really I mean you could use a lot like I think an apricot jam would be really yes. nice peach jam would be really nice yeah I've done it with I got into blueberry jam in the past year but I haven't tried that as the salad dressing but that could be nice too that could be interesting yeah right? it'd be intense yeah that's uh it's and I'm definitely going to try that it looks great um now oh also I wanted to ask you about your grilled cheese grid which was really cool and you say you only need three ingredients to make a perfect grilled cheese um what's your perfect grilled cheese oh everybody has an opinion about grilled cheese everyone has an opinion I feel very strongly about mayonnaise on the outside of the bread um, oh yes my husband and I've had this fight so many times he defaults to butter um oh, but no, it's got to be mayonnaise it's got to be mayonnaise um and mayonnaise is fun because you can mix things in really easily. If, you know, the butter is cold, you don't have to worry about it not being spreadable. Um, so definitely mayonnaise. I really like a, <laughs> I really like like a melty cheese. Like I like a cheddar, but something that's even gooier, like a pepper jack. Yes. I'm really into right now. This um, is the, this is Emma's grilled cheese. Great. <laughs> <Choose your adventure. laughs> You've thought this, this is fun. And I, I think. I usually like like a um, like a sauerkraut or a kimchi tucked oh, in yes. there with the cheese. I think sometimes, I mean, this is it's a whole point of the book, but I think like one or two maybe, and then sometimes it gets to be too much. I think if you add too much, then the cheese can, uh, you know, hold the two slices of bread together, and that's where yes. everything. So do you use one type apart. of? Do you use one type of cheese or several? almost always one type that okay. I think the times when it comes into several is which happens frequently is if we have like a little bit of this cheese that's about to go bad and a little bit of that yeah. cheese that's about to go bad then we're like okay just throw it into a sandwich before everything starts to mold but yes. if, if all the cheese is not about to mold then I'll usually just pick one. Oh, great yeah you've got you've got some um excellent highly recommended combos down the side which um I mean, they, they're so great. Pumpernickel, apricot jam and blue cheese. Amazing. Um, focaccia, telegio and artichokes. So good. And what's your favorite <laughs> bread? What's your favorite bread? Oh, I, for a good cheese. I love challah. I'm Jewish. So, yeah. you know, challah, <laughs> yes, challah so is good. one of my favorites. And I think, you know, I usually, if I'm just eating toast, I usually like a, like a crustier, more um, like a sourdough or something like that. Mm. But I think when you're, you're griddling something like a hollow or brioche something enriched is really nice because if they brown so beautifully yeah. and it all just becomes kind of gooey and crispy and your teeth don't have to work too hard which is nice oh, perfect, perfect. <laughs> now I just wanted to remind um people who've joined us on the call that if you've got questions you can pop those into the Q&A box there's a few there already and we'll kind of tackle those towards the end um yeah so I wanted to ask, I mean this is something that people um often ask me when a new book has come out mm -hmm. it's like if I wanted to start cooking from the book what recipes should I start with you know because it's you oh. know like I, I feel like cookbooks are always they're like um a story it's like you're entering yeah. a new world when you mm -hmm. pick up a cookbook and you decide yes I'm going to get into this book and I'm going to cook you know more than one recipe I'm going to cook a lot of this book um yeah. the people are always asking for well, what's the you know first two or three recipes I should start with do mm. you have some of those recommendations for this book I, I have some personal favorites I uh -huh. think um one one's coming to mind is the tomato soup that is a, ah, oh, a yes. very That's creamy so tomato soup but it doesn't have any cream and the creaminess comes from um cashews which you soak oh, yeah. and then you blend up until it's you know a milk it's like the easiest not milk in the world but it all the creaminess also comes from onions so a lot of tomato soups have onions this tomato soup has a lot of onions like a ton of onions that you saute down oh, and it then does. when you puree the soup they become this um source of like lushness 
and you know extra flavor and savoriness, but it really changes the texture of the soup in a way that you can't quite pinpoint when you're eating it. That soup was one that I just, I, when we were testing it, I loved, you know, I'm sure you have this too. There are some recipes that when you make them, you know, five times in a week, you don't want to eat it ever, yes. ever again. And the ever. tomato soup was one of those ones that I just kept tucking in the freezer and I wasn't sad to take it out. Like I think actually for lunch today or yesterday, we had a quart of it that was still from recipe development. Wow. There are so many that we're getting through, but I was like, you know, I wasn't mad to see it. I didn't, I, you know, because it's I've just, it's very classic. Put, I've post, I've put a post. On <laughs> I love, we love tomato soup in our family. Like yeah. if you do any kind of tomato soup, no one is, no one is going to complain about it. Um, and this, this is two pounds of onions, guys. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like, a lot. It's a lot, but I kind of love that. I love just the way you've just doubled down on this ingredient because it does, onions have so many layers of flavor mm -hmm. um, and that sweetness that really comes yeah. out when you've cooked it a long time and obviously in such a large quantity. So I think this is definitely one I'm going to be trying very soon. And it's got a whole can of tomato paste. I love that. Yeah, <laughs> the tomato paste to it when you you add that to the, you know, pan and, you know, it starts to caramelize. So you are using canned tomatoes too, but that mm -hmm. tomato paste, it kind of, it makes the tomato flavor really pop and really intensify. And it makes it, um, that's the kind of thing where it's compensating for a lot of other ingredients that tomato soups might have. Yeah. This one doesn't, but the tomato flavor is so intense and pure that you don't mind and you don't even think it's missing something. Oh, that's fantastic. So thank you so much for that tip. And any others, any other recipes we should try? I'm again, just yeah. asking for myself. So. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of something sweet. There is a hazelnut cake that Ooh. I really love. It's uh, gluten-free and it's one of those recipes that I feel like, you know, it just happens to be gluten-free. Yes. You it's, I mean, the, the cake is mostly ground up hazelnuts. That, is it this one? Um, yes. Yeah. So it's hazelnuts and uh, eggs and sugar. Um, truly just like the simplest cake, but it's very uh, dense and fudgy and moist and flavorful. And all that's coming from, you know, just a nut that is really delicious to begin with. Um, mm. And it has a chocolate sour cream frosting on it. But wow. there's a, a brittle on top that it's also hazelnuts and sugar, which are two ingredients in the cake. But in this context, it's bigger pieces of hazelnuts and the sugar is caramelized and then you smash it up. So it ends up kind of like sprinkles. So it's like the same ingredients right next to each other, but they have like totally different personalities. Wow. Um, and it, it feels very impressive, but it's, um, I, I don't think it's stressful to make. I know I really like making cakes for people's birthdays, but yeah. sometimes when I'm doing the structure of a layer cake and I used to work as a baker, so I feel like I should be not stressed by this thing, but it always sometimes tips and, you know, there are things start to wilt and that can be, um, you know, like great British bake off, you know, yeah. <laughs> crying in your kitchen over a cake, but I, with this single layer cake, like there's none of that. So I really like that. It's just, it looks very beautiful, but like, there's almost no way to mess it up. Oh, it looks so good. And could you use, could you substitute a different nut if you didn't yeah. have hazelnuts? Yeah. This was one that was inspired by something we had on the site. Um, it was a, um, it was a pecan recipe that I think we had in the column. Um, so pecans, they're very, um, really like fatty, like, a, yeah. like joyfully fatty. Um, and that's really nice too. Yeah. I think, okay. You, yeah. I mean, I think you could play around with just about any nut that you have in your freezer. I think it calls cool. for like three quarters of a pound into a single layer cake. So any nut that you have in excess could be fun to experiment with. Okay, cool. Well, I post put post-it notes on both those recipes. <laughs> I'm going to be straight from the source. You've recommended them, so I'm excited. Um, now, do you, in your everyday life, do you, are you do you cook in the big little recipes way? Sometimes, and not yeah. always. You know, yeah. I think I because it's uh, like the 
almost all of the recipes I develop for work are in this mindset. You know, yes. I think it's um, when you're working as a recipe developer or on a cookbook, there's sometimes it can be hard to separate when you're eating for work and when you're eating for yourself. Um, and I think this, you know, adding ingredients is sometimes an easy way for my brain to go like, okay, I'm off the clock. And, you know, this is yeah. just fun because I'm making a sauce and I'm adding like the 70 different things that are in my fridge right now, just to see what yeah. happens. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you just go a little crazy and go, <laughs> sorry, I mean, I'm going to go, I'm going to be a maximalist tonight. I'm exactly. Not yeah. But I mean, I also like my like favorite breakfast in the world is just buttered toast. And, you know, yeah. that's, I think very big little recipe in mindset if you have good bread you have good butter like I don't think you need anything uh, else not nothing better really nothing um, better. I'm just having a look at the time so we've got some questions which I might pop over to so we have time to answer them um Chris has asked what are some of your favorite cookbooks what are some of my favorite cookbooks <laughs> well I, I'm, really not, I'm, not, I'm not saying this because you're modern, but I, I do your cookbook to Asia with love. I oh, it was just, I think I one of like the, my favorite uh, things that I read in the pandemic, I like, I got this reading chair to kind of have like a cozy space. Um, and I just remember reading it cover to cover and um, just wanting to make everything in it, which I think, you know, was so exciting because well, thank you. when you can't go anywhere having something to get like feel um looking forward to your own kitchen again in yeah. a new way was really cool um I'm really excited about Aber Barron's new book Grist um yeah. really like Valerie Lomas's uh, Life is What You Bake It I think I mean, oh yes that's a good I just one I, yeah, I just feel like there are so many good ones that have come out in the past year yeah um okay thank you and then Nina has asked uh, was there an ingredient besides the usual suspects garlic onion mm. salt etc that seemed to keep popping up a lot in the recipes mm. um I think scallions are one that I I'm really obsessed with I think yeah they're they're one of those ingredients that I guess <laughs> You said onion and garlic, and now I'm saying scallions. I really like alliums. It's like the clear yes. <laughs> thing here. But I you know agree. what? When they're raw, uh, you know, raw onions can be intense for a lot of people. Um, but scallions, they're much mellower. Um, and they kind of have the effect of, uh, you know, they have that sharpness, but there's also an herbiness. Mm -hmm. But then when you cook them, they become almost like a green. Yes. And then even in the scallion, there's the white part, there's the green part. I just... Um, I was just, I feel like I'm, I just never, I can never get enough of them. And I, I also really like that they're one of those ingredients that you can add like a ton of and not be overwhelmed by. Um, Absolutely. I completely yeah. agree with, with you. I'm obsessed with scallions. It's like a very, it's a mm -hmm. smell that's very familiar from my childhood, but mm -hmm. it's, it is like, it is used as a green in Chinese cooking. Mm -hmm. um, it's so inexpensive. You know, often you see it like, three bunches for a dollar and you right. know like there's a part of my mind that goes what am I going to do with three bunches but I could use that if you Definitely. use them like a vegetable so you yeah um you char them like you would for mm. your green and they become they're so sweet they're yes. incredible they're so sweet so um they really do have lots of different elements to it so yeah. that is um that's a great one uh now Chris has asked what is the, who are the crucial people who have helped shape your food journey? It's a good question. Oh, hard question. I'm a hard question. I mean, I think too many to list for sure. But I think, I mean, it, this is probably true for a lot of people. It definitely started with my grandma and my mom. Um, you know, I the thing that excited me about going into food publishing was home cooking and home cooks mm. and people who get dinner on the table every night, even though they had work and something broke and this had to be fixed and they were out later than they thought they would but like you still have to eat um so yeah you know I just I was very lucky to grow up with a a mom who um made home cooking feel exciting but also cozy and a source of comfort um mm. and yeah you know just growing up around good yeah. Jewish food that was um that just made me really like eating. And I think everything came from there. You know, I'm so grateful for, you know, 
when I worked in kitchens, you know, people who I worked with, who I learned from in a more uh, formal way and, you know, cookbooks, and, I mean, a million cookbooks, but I think it all begins with like where you ate when you were a kid. Yeah, I agree. I think the, um, you know, food that's around when you're younger is, is, you know, you don't always have to, like people often ask me, did you cook all the time when you were young? And I'm like, I never cooked. I never, I mm. made myself sandwiches, but, um, you know, cooking with my mum was something that is a different thing in our house. But mm. I was around food and so I always appreciated yeah. um, what the power of what food could be as more yeah. than just, you know, sustenance, but it's this other thing that keeps you connected to people. And, um, but that's, that's the importance of food, isn't it? it? Doesn't, it almost doesn't matter what you're eating. Um, yeah. It just, it's just like, you know, having good food put on, having food put, put on the table every night and just, mm. you know, sharing, sharing memories around that food. So, totally. um, yeah. And I guess Food 52 is very much a, a platform for home cooks. I think that's yeah. why it's kind of perfect for you because, you know, it's so much about uh, that, that sense of community and sharing yeah. um, the knowledge base. I mean, even that, that one recipe that I have on Big Little Recipes on your column, mm. which is the, the steamed water egg custard from my, yeah. from Tuesia with Love, people still talk about it and like make give each other recommendations and I didn't really I mean I get all the notifications because it's my recipe but I don't really have to say anything because they kind of just helping each other out which is yeah. such a unique thing about food 52 I think totally yeah yeah I mean it's when you cook every day you are like an expert at it you know and I think yeah. there's a lot of um you know, it's easy to look at culinary school or restaurant work and you say, okay, this is formal or this is professional and that's all true. Um, yeah. But the people who do it every way, every day in their homes, like they're, I mean, that's more than people do most things. Um, yeah. And, you know, they're so passionate about and excited and it's really true. Like if someone asks a question about something, sometimes by the time I get it, people have already answered it. And like, I have nothing else to add. Like they have it covered. Yeah. 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 I love that. I love that um now more question jane has asked has said hi are there any combinations you've tried that have failed and do not recommend um <laughs> i mean probably probably a million um what have i tried well i i mean most recently i this ended up working out but i i published this recipe for lodka cookies um we were it was for you know our cookie package at food 52 and i wanted just doing a big little recipe for it and i thought like okay what if you oh, take a, i think i saw it yes a lodka and you turn into a cookie um and i mean my first tests they were absolutely unrecognizable from my what ended up working it was just everything was going wrong i was using fresh potatoes and sugar I was trying to create like a potato brittle um and oh, wow. it, it was just um absolutely not working out um I started working on a pasta recipe that we're going to have running next year and um we ended up abandoning what the original idea was because I you know started working on it and um sometimes in a first test I don't know if you've experienced this like you're like, okay, well, this is awful, but I know I can get it where I'm trying to get it. I know I can get it somewhere good. And um, sometimes I'm like, oh, this is just awful. And even if I get it to be better, it's not going to be good enough. Um, you know, I, I live with a person who is incredibly complimentary and kind <laughs> and, uh, you know, like pretty much anything I put in front of him, he's like, this is good. Um, and, you know, I, I'm the opposite way. So I, I usually don't like a lot of things before I get to the thing that I like. It's just my new <laughs> recipe. I love that. And then the latka cookie ended up being you used potato chips in the end, right? Yeah, the fresh potatoes were just not working at all. And then I started thinking about coconut macaroons, which is another Jewish cookie. And um, yes. that's when I started kind of pivoting into like a completely different direction. But I just kind of had to give up the fresh potatoes because I was like, we're going to kill too many potatoes if trying to get this to work because I just think it's not gonna yeah I mean it's definitely a good idea I mean I mean but I think potato chips in a in a dessert recipe is 
probably better because it has that saltiness and it doesn't have the moisture. The moisture is right. Is similar, right? Totally. Yeah. Yes. Now we have one other question. Um, Planina has asked, how do we make the most out of grocery store produce? It often feels like the quality isn't as good as the farmer's markets, especially things like the green tops of radishes yeah. or beets. I mean, often you don't even get the tops from the supermarket. Totally. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's hard. Yeah. I, this is my, I have a CSA that runs for like half the year and we just kind of entered the half of the year where I don't have it. Mm. And I always feel it. Uh, you know, my mood drop when I stop getting those boxes on my door um, because the produce is just not as flavorful. Um, but I think it's, you know, in months or maybe you can't get it, it's technique comes into play a lot. Like there's a, a braised fennel in the cookbook that you mm-hmm. braise in um, cream that's mixed with minced anchovies. Sounds, there's like a... a odd bedfellows um but it looks really good it's delicious and then you turn those um even if you don't have too much of the fennel tops even if you just have a little bit you can slice those really thinly and then pick like quickly pickle them in a vinegar um so you're getting a lot out of a fennel that I just I really don't think it would have to be it wouldn't have to be the world's best fennel to begin with even though the dish seems like it's just fennel but then you add um cream which just obviously makes everything better and you add anchovies which have a lot of umami and saltiness um Mm. and those kind of and then you add you cook something concentrates its flavor kind of intensifies it um I think that sort of treatment can come into play a lot like um I guess basically what I'm saying is treating a vegetable like you would treat a meat so you know cooking it adding some fat adding some acid at the end, like giving it kind of like a real low and slow, um, intense respect. I think that can help a lot. You know, I mean, obviously if you start out with produce that's lackluster and you just eat it plain, it's not going to be, um, anything but lackluster, but if you add some technique to it, it can can really brighten it up. Yeah. I think that, um, yeah, I really agree with you. I mean, I think market produce is, is of course, you know, the best. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's just not practical. And, you know, you can't always get to the farmer's market or you there's no CSA box this week um, or this season. Uh, but I still think like with, you know, having some of the things, you know, the techniques that you have in this book, you can still get flavour out of supermarket produce. I mean, I think that... So many people, I mean, I think there's so many barriers to cooking um, mm-hmm. that, you know, people feel like they can't cook. If I don't have the, the bunch of radish from the farmer's markets with all the tops, I can't cook yeah, yeah. Um, that meal. But I think it's more important that we adapt and be flexible. Mm-hmm. And if we, if it's all we can do is use, you know, supermarket produce, I think it's absolutely fine. I use supermarket produce a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, because that's what's practical to me and we can still create beautiful meals out of you know like having ingredients and some of the little mm-hmm. t- tips and tricks that you have in this book and you know the clever use of ingredients um things like that so yeah just don't, don't let that stop you from cooking I think yeah totally agree. yeah totally and I think it's time for um is Lara back I am. I'm back. <laughs> I <Hi. heard> you. <laughs> yeah, I'm like hovering here. <laughs> on the screen, like. uh, thank you so much, Emma and Hetty. That was such a great conversation. Thank and you I so am inspired much. to cook. I was sitting here, my kitchen is being remodeled. And so oh, and I'm almost three months into it now. And I have like such like cooking just I cannot wait to really start doing it again. <laughs> so listening to both of you talk about these like gr- just grilled cheese and tomato soup, I'm like, oh my god, torture! So, That's but like I a can perfect see meal right there. It happening from where I'm sitting, and I'm like, hurry up, dude! Anyway. <laughs> thank you so much. Congratulations again on the thank book, you. Emma Hetty. Thank you for for such a great conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. And I hope you all stay safe and healthy. Thanks Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.